right, we are at the top of the hour. Thank you and welcome to tonight's episode of Net DevOps Live. Joining us tonight is Matt DiNapoli and he will be covering what's the big deal about source control and describing why you should be putting your network configurations into Git. During tonight's session, we will be handling all of the question and answers through the Q&A panel. So if you have any, please feel free to drop those in and we'll address them as we go through. As always, the first question is often, where can I get access to the slides, links, code samples, and so on? And all that information is already posted under the webinar resources for this episode. So you can find those up and online. With that, I'll hand it over to Matt to take us away. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Hank. I uh, appreciate the introduction there and welcome. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for what's the big deal about source control and why your network configuration should be in Git. My name is Matt DiNapoli. I am a dev advocate for DevNet. And what I do is I, I talk about Net DevOps things. I talk about inter, uh, integrating with our platforms. And so this is the place to be. And uh, we hope you guys enjoy. Um, what are we going to talk about today? So if you attended some of the previous sessions in the Net DevOps uh, live series, uh, we talked about the Net DevOps tool bag, and so we're going to focus on one specific area within that tool bag, and uh, we'll actually point that out and see where we're at in that space. Uh, we also talked about, or we've also talked about in previous sessions, the CI/CD pipeline, and we're going to focus again on a couple of areas within that CI/CD pipeline today, and um, we'll point out exactly where this source control conversation or Git falls into those places. Um, we will evaluate a need for version control and why this is a necessary thing as we move into network programmability. Um, we're also going to see what we get, and pun is absolutely intended there, um, from our, our version control tools. Uh, we will then be introduced to some of the vernacular within Git, how to call some of the commands and some of the things uh, from an introductory perspective that we can expect when working with, with Git. And then finally, we'll get into a demo of using, uh, or the Git flow using a version control system called GitLab. So we'll walk through all of these things, and as we're going through them, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A panel as part of the WebEx events. So the first thing we want to cover is where within the Net DevOps Engineers tool bag are we? Um, so we are right at the top, and this is our distributed source control area. Um, and like I mentioned before, previous talks have covered some of the tool bag, uh, some of the other tools within the tool bag at a high level. Um, but now we're going to start driving down into those things. And the focus of today is the one that's circled in red there, um, covering distributed source control. Uh, and you'll see a number of different tools listed there Git, Subversion, Mercurial, GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab. And the, the two that we'll talk about today are GitHub and GitLab. Um, and I should say three, and ultimately we have um, Git going on there as well. Uh, the distributed portion allows for collaboration amongst the team. Uh, no source control tool is worth its salt if it doesn't allow more than one engineer to work on it at a time, and so that's why we have that focus of distributed source control um, in our Net DevOps engineers tool bag. Uh, but you can see that that particular tool set then drives down to the rest of the things that we have to worry about in dealing with uh, Net DevOps or network programmability. And so um, how you leverage the version source control or, or version source control uh, tools uh, affects how the build server works. Um, we'll tie down into our configuration management for our devices. Um, it'll also drive how we manage our network test tooling and uh, telemetry monitoring. And then that, uh, that then hits into our data models for our particular devices and allows us to not just build out um, virtualized environments for our, um, for our networks, but it also allows us to build out or push those test environments uh, or push the configurations for those test environments um, to our production environments. So um, everything is driven from that original distributed source control tool that we use at the top there. We also, um, so as we're going through a lot of these uh, Net DevOps live talks, we are using a CI CD demo environment. 
and the one that we are using today is leveraging Git for version control and more specifically, more specifically a tool called GitLab. Uh, circled in red here we have uh, the version control piece and you can see that that, that, that is at the beginning of our um, CI CD pipeline and it's feeding um, our Ansible uh, scripts uh, in feeding into NSO. Um, it's uh, managing our uh, Vagrant environments. Our source control is then any changes is then uh, are being built out and then put through viral and PyAts for testing. And then if we need to then push to production, we can do that um, through our source control as well. So we can see how this source control feeds into everything. Everything else is follow on. And so this step is foundational and critical to the success of the Net DevOps automation process. And then finally, we have the Net DevOps configuration pipeline. So this is a more generalized version of the steps that we are going to take as we walk through this and so that we can treat our network as code. So these are activities that developers in um, classic software development environments have been using for years, if not decades, depending on uh, how, how they've taken on these aspects. Uh, but we have, uh, originally we're gonna create a code branch and that is our safe space that we're going to work in. Um, so if we have an idea for a change or we're working through a new issue, um, the best place to do that is in a branch that isn't affecting the uh, main trunk of code that we're working from. We're going to do our implementation of the network as code, and so uh, we're going to update our Ansible scripts or we're going to um, update some of our configuration files as necessary. Once we're done with that and we're comfortable with the changes that we've made, we're gonna then test that change locally um, to make sure that uh, we're not putting anything out into the test environment um, that we're not comfortable with running on our um, own test environments. Uh, we'll commit those changes uh, and we'll see how to actually do those commits as we move forward in this, uh, in this talk. And then uh, we go through the, the process of kicking off our build, instantiating our test network, deploying the network as code, running the full test plan, and those are all those other tools that we had seen in the Net DevOps tool bag. But then once we get comfortable with the fact that everything has run through the full test plan, and this is now something we can push to production, our source control tools then come back into play with merging that change into our production environment. So it feeds everything really early, um, but then as we get to the point where we wanna actually get everything out the door and into our production environment, we can do that. Now, if our, if our test uh, scenario doesn't run as, ex as expected, uh, we can then uh, investigate those problems and run through the whole scenario again. And, create that code branch, implement the network as code, et cetera, et cetera. And so, again, this comes back to that point that our source control is really the foundational aspect to this whole process, and it feeds um, everything that we're going to be doing later. So what's the need for version control? You might not be used to having to do these things in the past, but as we move into this network programmability concept, we want to take on some of the aspects that classic software developers have used in the past uh, too much success. And so um, because we're working on things as a team and not necessarily individually, or even if you're uh, working on something individually, uh, we do always recommend using some sort of version control. So the questions that we would like to address as part of using version control is how do I make incremental changes and share my work with others? Um, we're gonna see very succinctly how we do those things through um, using Git and GitLab. We can also see how we go back to a version of the file from any point in time. Um, it can be yesterday, last week, last year. Uh, the tools that we'll be using cover um, changes that are committed for any point in time. Um, we can also take a look at what has changed between version X and version Y. And there are a lot of times when working on files or on uh, projects that um, the same file might be worked on by more than one person at the same time. And so um, there will be a need to identify what changes um, uh, person A had made while working on issue A uh, versus what uh, person B had uh, changed while working on issue B and if their uh, changes can be merged into that same file so uh, being able to see that goes through our version control um, uh, the need for our version control 
Uh, so how do we reconcile and merge all of these things together? All of that is covered within the tool itself, which makes that super useful. So what does that mean when we say Git and then GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket, etc.? So Git in and of itself is a, for all intents and purposes, a protocol. Um, it is a set of commands that uh, allows you to uh, leverage this model of version control. Uh, we have GitLab, GitHub, or Bitbucket are all, are all implementations of that Git protocol. Um, as a point of historical reference, uh, Git was developed, uh, from what I understand, by um, Linus Torvalds and the Linux Foundation because they needed something that um, helped them develop the Linux kernel in a more collaborative manner. The Linux kernel is an open source project and so uh, they were finding that previous uh, or existing version control methods uh, were not meeting their needs for how rapidly they were working, how collaborative they were being, and how large the actual project was. And so uh, Git in and of itself was born of working on a specific software project that uh, was one of the defining open source projects of our, of our time. So um, it, is a, it is a tool and process that is being widely adopted uh, amongst developers. GitHub, GitHub, which was just uh, recently purchased by Microsoft, um, is one of the largest repositories of code in the world. Um, and I think they boast somewhere between seven and eight million developers that interact on their site at any given point in time. Um, or I'm sorry, over the course of their existence. And so um, we can see that adoption. And, and now as we talk about not just Net DevOps, uh, but we talk about DevOps processes. Uh, the consensus is that your your validity in the realm is tied to your GitHub repositories. Um, it's tied to your GitHub profile, and so being able to look at a developer's um, contributions to specific products, their repositories, how many times that they, um, and we'll see this, how many times their projects are starred or forked. Um, can lend to, uh, can even be a resume builder for certain developers in the DevOps or Net DevOps space. So that is the difference as we talk about these things of Git versus these implementations of Git, which are GitLab, which is the one we're going to see today, or other things like GitHub and Bitbucket, etc. So ultimately, what do I get from these things? Um, and again, a uh, pun was certainly intended. Um, the first big thing that uh, that we get from this are uh, project management items, and so um, I'm actually going to jump over to um, GitHub, and this is what GitHub lo looks like. This is the Cisco DevNet home for all of the repositories that uh, we as Dev Evangelists to provide our business units, our product teams provide to support integrations into Cisco product. And so if you're looking for code that supports the concepts around net pro network programmability, DevOps, um, if you're looking for something that, f that falls in with Cisco Learning Labs, this is the place to do that. And you can go into any of these repositories that don't say private. So um, let's just say we want to work through um, uh, SDK for Go, uh, for YDK, for Yang Data Models, and I wanted to um, pull that down and, and start working from that, I could. And so all that code is open to me. Um, we see that there have been 18 commits over that period of time. Um, there's only one branch, so they haven't, they're all, usually if you see one branch there, there's only one person working on it. Um, but we see a number of uh, stars and forks, and so um, this provides us some value to this particular project. Uh, a project within Cisco DevNet that has 15 stars is pretty good. Um, and if there are three forks, that means that uh, three developers have come in and decided to take the base code that's been provided on this and build out their own projects in their own space. And so that's where those two things come from. Uh, we see the notion of um, pull requests, and we're going to see a little different vernacular here when we talk about um, how we manage uh, manage new issues coming in or new features coming in. Um, in GitHub, they call them pull requests. In uh, GitLab, they call them merge requests. And so uh, just know that if we're talking about a pull request or a merge request, they are the, um, for all intents and purposes, the same thing. They're just uh, uh, 
different names for, for those between the different tools. Um, within a particular environment, this one doesn't have issues turned on, so uh, that was a, a bad job by me to figure that out, but uh, let's say we're looking at, we're gonna look at a private lab just for fun. If we had an issue, oh, here we go. So issues are turned on for this one, um, and I can then manage that process of working on that product with um, with these issues. And so if I come across something that I don't like or needs changed, I can open up an issue for it and, and provide a project management flow for that. And as a, me as a developer who owns this particular piece, I can go in then and say, all right, I'm gonna work on this issue, open that up, create a, a new branch for it to work in a safe space, and then bring that back in when I feel that it's comfortable and can be merged. And then the owner of this project or the team that owns this project can then come back in and say, all right, this issue has been resolved to our satisfaction through this branch, we've tested it out, and now we're gonna merge this into the main trunk of our particular code. So those are um, just some of the things that are available to us, some of the things we get from our GitHub or GitLab implementations. We also have the notion of code review, and so we talked about those pull and merge requests, but once um, you submit that code, then you can walk through the process of proactively requesting review and then managing the feedback from that review. Um, we use uh, GitHub, uh, pr private repositories of GitHub, for managing our learning labs on Cisco DevNet. And so uh, part of our process is then reaching out to our colleagues and saying, hey, I made an update to this particular learning lab and um, all of our learning labs are written in Markdown, so we treat our learning labs as code, just like you would treat a network configuration as code, or a, um, uh, sorry, a, uh, well, you could treat a network configuration as code, or you can also treat a um, an Ansible script as code. And so those kinds of things can uh, allow us to, to push out the request for review or, or manage the feedback in that space. I mentioned earlier we have the capability then of also seeing the differences between our files. So if we make one change to another and we are depend or we're making a decision as the project owner whether or not to merge that file back in or merge the changes into the to our main main master branch, um, we can see those differences and see what's actually been changed without hunting for what the old version of that file was or having to worry about being able to go back and forth between those. It actually makes it very clear how we do that, and we'll see that in our demo in a little bit. Uh, finally, and probably most importantly, is this branch management piece. And I, I mention branches a lot because um, this is a concept that I think people struggle with when they start working with Git repositories, but it is something that is of absolute importance to understand. Um, your branch is your is your safe sp space, it's your sandbox, it's the area that you wanna be doing your uh, creative work in or experimenting um, because that branch does not affect the main code that's being either deployed to our test environment in our CI CD pipeline or the code that's being uh, ultimately pushed to production. And so uh, being able to work in that concept of branch um, is probably one of the most powerful things that comes out of using a version control system like Git. So here's some basic Git terminology. Uh, the first thing, and you heard me say this as we we're looking at GitHub, is the repository or repo. And uh, basically you'll say something like, hey, send me the link to that repo. Um, so that's all it is is a vault for storing our version controlled files um, within our local machines, our laptops, our servers, um, a repository will be just a file directory. Um, it looks like a regular folder and it will have all of the files that are tied sp specifically to that repo. Um, then within, and this is where the magic comes from as part of Git, within that is a hidden file called the .git, or I'm sorry, a hidden directory called the .git directory. And in that is everything that you ever need to know about that particular repository. And so I said that's where the magic happens because that's where the Git protocol or the, the, the Git tooling is implemented as in within that .git directory. So um, if, if a repository or a directory is Git initiated um, or 
yes, git git initiated, then it will have that dot git directory, and all of the information and all of the commands that we run with git will look into that dot git directory to get the information necessary to make decisions around branching, around the current status, if there's specific logging information that's available to us for each commit. Um, and that is all part of the concept of the repository. Our working directory is the visible directory and its contents. Um, so within a repository, you might have several directories that are part of that. They're just folders of files. Uh, we also have version files, the concept of version files. So um, when you initialize a repository uh, for to be managed by Git, all of the files by default will be tracked. Um, it, and then you can go through the process of um, telling Git that you don't want certain things to be tracked, so unversioned files. Um, one of the things that we recommend for developers to do, especially when they're getting um, introduced to concepts around development and Python and, and network programmability, is we tell them to start using things called virtual environments. And those virtual environments um, basically copy down uh, instance of Python, and Python installs have thousands of files that are with them. And you don't want necessarily want to um, push those um, push those virtual environments up to your Git repository because um, you don't want the, the person that's using your Git repository or the collaboration that you're doing with your team to be pulled down with that. And so there might be an instance where you're add to your .git ignore file hey, I don't want any time that I create a virtual environment for this particular repository, please put that in the unversioned area and do not track it, do not push it up to the remote repository and just let it be. So that's the difference between the versioned and unversioned files. The commits, um, that's our snapshot in time, that's basically our save point. Um, so as we're going through and we're updating our files, we do have to save them directly, but to um, have Git track those particular things or stage them, um, we have to pr uh, provide a commit. And then I, I touched on branches earlier, but again, just to reiterate, this is our safe place for us to work. This is a, um, a split off of work done by different people. And as they're working on these different branches, and they can include uh, they can include the same files between branches, and we'll see that in our demo. Um, and as we go through them and, and get our things done, um, then we bring those branches back in and merge them with our with our main code uh, main code branch. Um, this is what the basic flow looks like, and anytime you um, leverage the git the uh, a new workflow you Im implement what we call a git flow and each system and when we say system I mean um, I'm a developer or I'm a network engineer working on a specific ansible script and that ansible script is being managed in a git repository um, that particular um, imp instance of that file is uh, sitting not just in the blessed repository, but if I copy it down immediately, it's now in the, my private repository on my machine. And as I work on it, I provide the update on my branch. And so this uh, mustardy color at the bottom here, the developer private, that's my local machine. Uh, when we go to developer public, that is our centralized version control system, the remote as we call it. We get that pushed up to, we get that branch pushed up and, um, and then the integration manager, and this could be a one person or a number of people depending on how the team is run, they will evaluate those submissions that are coming from that developer public space. So if we have different branches, branch A and branch B coming from each of these developers, the integration manager will take the look at the changes and make sure that they don't step on each other, there isn't a merge conflict and uh, make a decision before pushing that up to that blessed repository. Um, and in this instance, it can be our test, or in our CICD pipeline that we've been looking at, it can be our test environment, but usually it's something that you're going to push up to production. So that's where our blessed repository comes into place. Now, um, all of the things that happen whenever you do a commit, um, uh, is laid out in this diagram. Commits contain trees. Um, Git does store full copies of all of those change files, and it also stores a tree which contains links to all of the change files 
and all of the previously committed unchanged files in the current commit. So it maintains a lot of information available to us. And you'll notice that there are these little um, uh, numbers, or uh, number, uh, letter and number combinations in the upper left corner, and that's the hash for that particular commit. Uh, Git computes a SHA-1 hash of all stored files, trees, and commits, and then uses those commit hashes to uniquely identify um, individual commits. By computing and then storing these hashes, Git can detect changes to files and assure that the files retrieved from the repository are exactly where they were when the uh, commit was put into the repository. So basically, anything that ends up in, um, in your dot git directory, anything that git figures out, um, is basically what you've put into it. And it can be, when I say you've put into it, I can mean your individual efforts, but also the combination of the team. And so in this diagram, we see um, an initial commit that just includes version one of the test.txt file. As we get into the second commit, it includes a new file and an update to test.txt to version two. And then the third commit is a, um, an update to that as well and a rollback into um, the first commit. So um, all of these things are capable of being done within the, uh, the, the Git protocol. Here's some useful Git commands. Uh, the original setup is to do a Git config. Uh, the, you tell the uh, setup or the, the Git installation on your laptop what your username and user email, email is. Um, so that when it does a post or a push to our remote, um, it knows who to identify and who to lay blame to whenever you're doing your work. Whenever you're doing a clone, you're actually downloading or, or uh, getting a, a Git repository. And so that's usually the first step that you're going to walk through before doing anything. You can't actually update any code without having the code, so you're going to do a Git clone. Uh, we can do fetch, uh, fetch uh, similar to git clone, but you can't fetch anything that it doesn't have reference to. So um, you'll do fetches later after cloning a repository down. This can fetch specific branches or tags that are identified as part of that particular repository. We can check the status of your local repository, and this is one of the more useful commands. Um, this will give you a view into uh, files that have been modified but aren't um, staged for commit, files that are staged for commit, and then um, files that you uh, can push up and are ready to go. If we want to create a new branch or check out an existing branch, uh, the checkout command is uh, the one you're going to use. So git checkout dash b, and then the particular branch name that we're going to be working with. If we want to add a file to our commit, we can also do a git add file name. Sometimes you'll see people uh, do a git add dot and it'll do a, an add of all the changed files for a particular um, activity. Um, depends on how the team works and what the, what the consensus is around managing that. A lot of times we'll uh, tell people, hey, only commit the, or only add the files that you've add or that you've uh, updated because if you try to add everything, you don't know what else has been managed. So um, being very conscientious about those files when you add them um, is recommended. When you're ready and feel comfortable that the files that you've added should be added to a specific, or should be uh, committed, and uh, so we're creating that snapshot that we talked about before, we can do a git commit, and then if we put in the directive dash m, you can then add a message to that particular uh, commit, so um, identifying the actions that had occurred as part of that. Once that commit is done, the last thing that you'll do is do a, a git push, and that actually takes the code that you've updated locally and pushes it to our rem remote or our central server. Um, so in our, in our demo that we're going to walk through, that central server will be managed by GitLab. Uh, finally, and this comes down to the integration manager that we saw in our previous or uh, two slides ago, that integration manager, that, that red box there, the git merge will happen at that particular point, um, being able to combine branches as part of those pull or merge requests that we had seen before. So this is what the flow looks like. Um, it, we are going to git fetch or clone our, our code from 
GitLab in this instance. Sometimes it can be other um, other repository management systems such as GitHub or, or Bitbucket. Um, it will then bring down the, uh, the latest code for that particular environment uh, to your machine and create a directory that you can work from then. If you want to create a new branch or work from a specific branch that already exists, you can do a git checkout. You edit your code within that branch so that we are in our safe space and not affecting the master uh, branch. Once we're done, we're going to do a git add and make sure that um, that file can then be added to the commit. We're going to do a git commit, which then pushes that code back up or uh, sets the code to be pushed back up to the remote. And then only then and only then when we do our git push, will we be able to um, share our changes with the central directory. So what you'll notice as you become more and more comfortable with these commands um, is you're going to do a lot of git clones, uh, you'll become more comfortable with the git checkout process, and then the biggest ones are git add, git commit, git push. Those are the three you're always going to do um, to make sure that even if you're working on projects where you have one branch and it's you working on it yourself, that uh, git add, git commit, git push, anytime you do anything that is of note and should be saved in a place that you can always retrieve it later. Um, that are those are the three commands that you will become very um, you'll you'll think about them in your sleep. <laughs> uh, so those are those are the ones that we like to push because um, you can't really do anything good without them. So let's all see this in action. Um, so I mentioned a number of times through all of this that we're going through GitLab. The first thing we're going to look at. So we we took a look at GitHub. Um, in GitLab here we have. Um, a product or a project called CICD three tier. Um, you might have seen this before if you have attended any of the other previous uh, talks at the Net DevOps talk or the Net DevOps Live um, uh, series. And so this might have be familiar to you. Uh, we have our list of files in our repository here, so uh, we can tell that on the left hand side here uh, we have um, our files, our commits that we've walked through, our branches that, that we've been able to work from, and um, more importantly, when we're in our files section, we can jump around from the branches that we've been working on. Now, if we want to take a look at the branches and, and how they sit from a visual perspective, we have our test branch, and that's our default branch, and we also identify that it's protected. Um, so any, any merge requests into test will be managed by someone who has that capability. Um, the production environment um, is coming from test, and so um, the original commit, the initial commit on this launch, uh, identifies it as currently merged. And just to, so I had a, another branch in there, um, I added a, a network VLAN to our uh, viral uh, YAML file uh, that allowed us to add a um, network for application two. So I ended up merging that into test and production so that all three branches are at the same same place. We also have our list of issues that we can work from if we want to. And so the the general workflow that we that we will uh, ad adhere to, and most teams will try and do this, is anything that you work on from the project management perspective will be managed within either an issues list or a task list of some sort. In this, in this instance, it's an issues list. And I can go in here as a developer and I can take a look at that particular issue and, and um, I can decide if I want to, to take on that issue and create a merge request or a pull request, uh, depending on which tool you're using. In this instance, it's a merge request. Now, um, I'm acting as the um, I'm logged in as developer here, and so this particular user is going to act as that integration manager, that red box that we saw in that slide earlier. And I'm going to actually jump over to another user and have them work through another issue um, so that we can see the different roles that play into uh, managing these things as a team. So um, we have, uh, this is user one, let me actually go to user Let's see, user two, okay, so this is another user in that project. 
they have uh, developer capabilities. They are not a maintainer of this project, so they don't have the same level of access that the developer role that we showed, or, or that the developer user um, has, bef uh, has that we had seen before. But they can come in here and they can look through the list of items that they want to work through, and they can choose one that they want to take out um, and work on. And so uh, they notice that the ad network for app one hasn't been done, so they take a look at that. And they're like, oh, I can do that. I can, I can update the environment to use v VLAN 301 for application one. I'll take this and uh, provide the update. So another little tool available to us within here is the ability to add comments so that we can uh, keep track of what we're doing and who's doing it is the other main thing. So I'm going to add that comment and then I will create a merge request. If I want, I can add a label here and say that it's um, I'm doing it so that it uh, other people know just quickly that uh, that's being done. And so that new label shows up there. We can do a create merge request. So now it's created a work in progress and it's asking me to resolve that issue, add network for app one. Now the nice thing here, and I haven't seen this in GitHub, so I can't tell you if this actually happens, but they tell you how to check out the branch. And they actually give you the commands that are available to us, so we don't have to remember them off the top of our heads. Obviously, the more you do this, the, the more um, you're used, you'll get used to you doing these things, and so you may not have to hit this section. Uh, but as we're getting started, this is a helpful little thing that's available to us to make um, to make our lives a little bit easier. So the first thing we want to do is fetch that origin and check it out. So let's copy that. And then I'm going to head over to my terminal where I have user2 logged in. So I did pull down that particular environment already. So I did that git clone piece. Um, I'll show you how that works um, when we get to our next user. Um, but because we already have that, I want to make sure that uh, I want to see what status I'm at. So right now, if I do a get status, whoops, I need to go into the repository. So make sure you do that first. And we do a get status. That will tell us we're on branch production. Uh, there's nothing to commit and the working directory is clean. So what that means is that pulled down when I did my git clone, it pulled down the production directory for this particular user. If I go um, git branch, just to see what branches we have available, we only have production available. And if we do a git branch dash r, uh, dash r will tell me uh, where the remote is. And so um, I only have access to production, but I can see that there's another branch available to me called test. Um, or at least that's what git locally um, expects here. Now when I do that, uh, that git fetch to do our update, it would help if I typed properly, git fetch and then um, origin. It tells me that I've pulled in two new branches and that I've got pulled in an update to test. And so that's what these lines down here are telling me. And so now if I do another get status, I'm still on branch production, nothing to commit, working directory clean, but if I do a get branch, still on production, but if I do a get branch r, dash r, now I have these new updated um, branches available to me if I wanted to work on them. I don't particularly want to work on those because they're already resolved branches. And so I'm going to check out, actually that's not true, I'm going to check out the one that has been created, the um, ad network for app one. So that was created within GitLab and has now been pushed to my Git management directory so that now that I can check that out as necessary. So now I'm in that branch. If I do a git branch again, so let me clear this, git branch. So now the star is next to 12 add network for app one. So now I can make my changes as necessary. Um, 
I know through whatever machinations that I need to uh, make a change to the uh, a file in host vars. So I'm going to go into host underscore vars. And I also know that I need to change the file dist1.yaml. So let's make a, a change to that particular file. Um, I'm using a inline uh, text editor called Nano. Uh, so that's what's opening up here. Uh, very lightweight, allows us to do some of these things inline without tying into a development environment. Um, wouldn't necessarily recommend, unless you're super comfortable with it, making a lot of big changes within this. Uh, development environments are usually a lot more helpful, but since we're, um, since we are just making some quick and easy changes to show the actual Git workflow, that's why I'm leveraging this. So we want to go down to, we're just going to make a simple up update to this YAML file. And you'll notice that we made some changes already to the, um, the VLAN setup. And so if I wanted to make another change here and add in one, I can do that. So ID 301, and then we're gonna add our name, app two, or app one, and then we're gonna save that. We're gonna write our file. And now what we do, if we do a git status, remember before we did a git status, it told us that uh, nothing had changed, we were on a particular branch, kind of boring. But now it's gonna tell us, oh, well, you've modified dist1.yaml, which is what we expected. Um, it is now not staged for commit, uh, so if I did a git commit, nothing would happen because I haven't actually added it to the, to the upcoming commit. And so it's telling me, it's giving me a little header here. So if you want to add that, do git add the file name to update what will be committed. And let's just say that I wanted to do that. But the next thing I will do is do git commit or git add. And so this is the first step of our three step process, dist1.yaml. And then if we do a git status again, it will help if we type git status. Um, it now tells me instead of being not staged to be committed, it says changes to be committed. So now I know that if I do a commit, a git commit now, that this particular file will end up in that commit. So I can do a git commit dash m updated for, for app one. Oh, I did make a little mistake here. So uh, remember I said you have to do the git config. I haven't done that yet. So this is a good, um, a good update for that. So we'll do a git config dash dash global user.email. And this particular user email is user02 at gmail.com. And we also need to do git config dash dash global user dot name user02. All right, that's all fine and good. Now I should be able to do the commit. And now it tells me what happened with that commit. We had um, in that branch, it tells us what branch we're working on, 12 ad network for app one, and it gives us our hash that we need to that we could reference if we wanted to. Um, it provided my message. It tells me how many files changed and what actually was uh, what actually occurred. Um, I deleted one line and then added in uh, three new lines. So that's that's why we see that here. If I wanted to look at the diff, I could do that. Oh, I can't do it now after I've done the commit. So I apologize. I could do a diff of the commit there. If we want to get log, we can actually see the things that have been updated as well. And so our last one, they go uh, most recent last.
you can see some of the other things that have occurred as part of this uh, Git repository. And then now, real quick, we'll jump back into our repository just to show you that we have not added app one yet to our particular branch. So if we go to 12 add network for app one, and we go to our host vars directory, and we look at dist one, I haven't actually pushed it up yet. And so when we go down to that particular section of that file, I'll make it a little bigger so you can see, we see that Uh, we still don't have 301 in here, as expected, because we haven't actually done that push. So if we go back into user 2's terminal and we do a git push, we should be asked for username, uh, user02, and the password. And once it accepts that, it tells me that it's walking through that process. And now it is written to that branch in our um, repository. So if I reload this file, we scroll down and now we see our app one has been added to that list. So that's all great. That's fine and good. We tested it locally. Our branches are feeling good. Now we want to get it into the test bed. So now we need to make a um, request to merge that. And so when we go back to our um, issues list we have let's see here a reference to our work in progress so we add add network for app one um, we're going to actually look at the work in progress and we want to make sure that everything is ready to go and can be merged into test so it tells me how to merge the branch and fix any conflicts that come up so we'll do a git fetch origin. So a lot of things happen there. Uh, we did a git fetch origin, so that provided an update that we needed, and then it checked out our origin slash test. So it's a checkout of that particular branch, and it tells us um, that we are now in a detached head state. I won't get into the complications around uh, managing where the head is in a particular Git instance. That is an advanced topic. Uh, but know that now we are trying to merge our branch into test. And so that's what's going to happen in this last line down here. And if I hit go on that, it will ask me to enter a commit message explaining why this merge is necessary so that when it goes to the merge manager or the integration manager, um, they can make an educated decision around that. And so I will update this file and say added VLAN 1 or 301 for app 1. And then I will save that. And because I added that in, it said merge made by recursive strategy, and it pushed that up into our merge. And so now, as being the um, being the one that had worked on that, I can now resolve the whip status. But I can't merge because I'm not the person that's capable of merging into that test, so I don't actually see that button open up. But um, as the integration manager, the person who can oversee and merge those things into our test, um, I should be able to do that. So let's turn this back over. So I can see all of the history now of everything that had been done. Um, here's the mention in the merge request. They created, or I created that branch as user02. I added the doing label, so I can see everything that's happening. Um, I can take a look at what's going on in the work in progress. And now, because I have capabilities as the integration manager to merge that, I can actually hit the merge button if I want to, or I could do that from the command line as well. We're going to take the easy path and just hit merge. 
and that will then merge our changes into test with that particular commit. Now if I wanted to look at what's in that commit and I kind of skip this step, I can see what those changes look like in the GUI. And so anything in green has been added, um, anything in red has been changed. And so we see our 301 app one that's been added. Um, we actually had a weird thing go in there uh, for that particular branch. Um, I think it was from using the, the nano um, editor. So we'll just ignore that for the time being. But we updated the, um, the our, our merged branch. All right, we merged our 12 ad network for app one into test. And now if we go to our test environment, so we're in the test branch. We can go to host vars, dist1.yaml. We can see up here the latest commit that we've done. And we can also see that when we go to our list of VLANs, that app one is there. So everything that we expected to happen because we've taken our branch and now we merged it with test. Um, everything is now updated. Now I could go through the process of then merging that into production. Um, we won't worry about that as we're running a little short on time. So that's our little uh, Git demo. You can see how it can get very complicated very quickly. Um, there can be times when people end up going through a process of working on the same file at the same time and generating merge conflicts. Um, we don't have enough time for that today, unfortunately. Uh, it is a very interesting scenario where multiple entries within a particu particular file will show up for the integration manager. So both, both branches of code um, are treated as valid and then as they go through the process of um, attempting to merge those branches. It comes down then to the integration manager or, or the integration managers to make that decision of which code to keep in. And they actively in some situations will edit the file uh, directly within, um, within the branch before pushing it up. So um, that you can see where that can get really complicated very quickly. Um, but you can also see how it's very safe to work in those branches and keep your code that you're working on from affecting uh, production as there are multiple steps that need to occur before we even got to our next branch up. So um, we talked about where we were in the Net DevOps tool bag. We're at the very top and that source control version source control feeds everything all the way down. We talked about where we were in the CI CD pipeline. We were at the very beginning when we're talking about um, managing our, our code and then we're in that scenario where we're talking about building everything out and then pushing it to production. Uh, we went over the need for version control, being able to keep track of our files, keep track of changes, um, manage our, help manage our projects for us, allow for collaboration. Um, we also looked at some of the uh, Git steps necessary to get our code down and to uh, make our changes, to make sure that we're doing that add, commit, push and that's our get by the book section. And then follow, finally, we went over our uh, Git flow using GitLab and working between um, a developer working on a particular file and that integration manager that's going to be going through the process of reviewing those submissions as they come in. So um, everything that we've done here will be available on uh, developer.cisco.com slash netdevops slash live, or netdevops. Uh, if you want, if you're interested in the documentation for Git and some of the um, some of the descriptions of the commands that we walk through today, the reference documentation on git-scm.com is excellent. Um, and then we leveraged GitLab today, so if you want to pull that uh, a an instance down and deploy it locally, you can do that as well uh, from GitLab.com. We also have. A learning lab that walks you through not quite everything that we did, but um, some of the things that we referenced today. So you can hit that at that uh, cs.co slash intro to git. Um, it's an introduction to git for 
mainly just pulling code, updating, and pushing changes back up to a remote repository. Um, as I walked through everything, I leveraged the multi-IOS sandbox with the CIC, uh, CICD demo. Uh, that is available on the DevNet sandbox and can be grabbed from that link there. And finally, the code samples um, that all of the code that was in our Git repository is available to us through the um, link there, code-sbx-multi. And that will come from GitHub. Uh, finally, as part of this whole process, uh, we are um, introducing and then asking people to uh, submit or provide some kind of work product to Code Exchange. Um, code Exchange is DevNet's um, community code sharing community. Uh, everything is tied back to a GitHub repository. Um, but uh, if you see a project that you're particularly interested in and you do some code review, uh, we do challenge you to open an issue. Um, if you see something that needs changed or a feature you would like to see added, um, send a pull request and potentially pull that um, code down, make some changes, and then uh, propose that change back up uh, through the process that we went through today and uh, to fix some error. Um, so uh, that's what I pr uh, pose to you as the Code Exchange challenge. Um, keep an eye on Code Exchange. Uh, it is becoming more and more the place where we push people who are trying to get started with sample code or have a particular project in mind. Um, someone's probably already started something in the direction that you're thinking, so give that a go and take a look at that. Uh, that's uh, dev developer.cisco.com slash code exchange. And if you're looking for more about Net DevOps, we have um, a whole slew of information that uh, builds upon this, um, goes way, way past it. Um, all of our Net DevOps Live uh, presentations are available to you at the Net DevOps Live uh, URL. Um, so any previous situation or previous talks, uh, we have the um, on-demand videos, we have the sample code references, we have the slides that, that you've seen here. Um, so go ahead and check those out if you missed any of them. Um, all of those are tied back to the Net DevOps blogs and the basis for all of this uh, came out of um, uh, Hank Preston's Network Programmability Basics video course which should be the baseline for anyone getting into network programmability. And if you have any more questions or um, you know, just want to chat and talk about Cisco integrations, uh, Net DevOps. Um, if you want to talk about Meraki and CMX, that's my specialty. Um, you can reach out to me at uh, mdenapol at cisco.com. My Twitter handle is at the DNAP. And if you want to check out some of my GitHub repositories, you can check those out on GitHub slash github.com slash denapom11. Um, if you ever need to figure out where the jumping off point is for everything Cisco DevNet, that is developer.cisco.com. Um, come in, join if you haven't, and uh, thank you guys, and I appreciate the time you've given me. Uh, have a good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks so much, Matt. Great, great session. The dialogue was awesome in the question and answer, and we will see everybody on next week's technical talk. Talk to you soon.